I'd like to welcome you. I'm Paul Kroll, head of the School of Physics and Astronomy, and it's uh, great to see an audience here for our Kaufmannus lecture. And uh, um, just a, a few words about the school and uh, some of our upcoming events. So uh, the Institute for Astrophysics is one of the components of our uh, faculty of 55 or so across all branches of physics and astronomy. And then um, tonight we'll be looking at the largest length scales and the oldest times that we, we uh, study in, in physics. Um, I hope you're able to participate in other events as the year goes along. I do know off the top of my head that in early January, there'll be the public shows for the uh, physics force in the school, um, which you can look for on a Saturday in early January. Um, but now I would like to introduce um, Evan Skillman, who is uh, uh, in his ninth year as, as director of the Minnesota Institute for Astrophysics. And um, among the many projects that he's pursued energetically has been really the uh, expansion of, of the Kaufmannus lecture series, getting more people here, um, more exciting topics. And I will now turn things over to him to introduce this year's Kaufmannus lecture. Thank you, Paul, and thank you all for coming to tonight's lecture. Really appreciate it. Carlos Kaufmannus was known as the ideal for all of us in that his students loved him and he shared his science with the public. And so to have a lecture series named after him is, is really apropos. Uh, it's taking place today because we have a donor that's that allows us to do this. And the donor is with us, uh, Jeff and Dana Puchel, who uh, graduate from our program. Jeff got his PhD in astrophysics here a while ago and uh, stayed in astronomy for a while and then switched to the private sector. And um, not oftentimes in popular literature, astrophysicists and rocket scientists get confused and Jeff is both of them. The difference is that we use satellites to look up and he uses satellites to look down and is involved with many things like uh, monitoring uh, climate change and things like that. So um, he's uh, made a name for himself in that and has been, you know, our, our sponsor. So we thank you very much for that, Jeff and Dan. Thank you. Um, today's speaker is Julianne Del Canton. Uh, she got her undergraduate degree at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Physics and then worked in the private sector for a while and then went to Princeton where she studied astrophysics. After that, she got a prestigious Hubble Fellowship at the Carnegie Observatory. And then she went to the University of Washington where she joined the faculty and later became the chair of the department there. And she's now, she was just recently lured to the Flatiron Institute, which is an institute for computational astrophysics in New York City that's funded by the Simons Institute. Um, so clearly um, she's, she's made quite a path. Uh, I we. We, we know each other quite well. I've had the, the honor to work with her on many projects. And I just want to give you a, sort of an idea about Julianne. There was a, now a decade ago, the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute was worried that Hubble was not being ambitious enough. That there, every year there's a call for proposals and they put, he put out a so-called multi-cycle call and said, okay, if, if, if you've been bound by this single year's worth of available time, uh, please propose. And there were three projects that were selected. Julianne was the prime investigator for one of those three projects, and it was to look at the Andromeda galaxy. She'll be talking about this in tomorrow's lecture for uh, the MIPA colloquium. Um, but for a while, one of the results that, that hit the public was that she was responsible for the largest ever image obtained with a NASA telescope. And there's her career is full of things like largest, first, that sort of thing. Um, I know a lot of you are aware of the James Webb Space Telescope and its, its success, it's up and it's working right now. Um, but these telescopes have a real long history, a legacy. There's people that first have to imagine it and Julianne is one. She's already been contributing to the work for Hubble's, hopefully Hubble's and Webb's successor. 
Um, it, it's, uh, you know, th so she's one of those outside the box kind of people that uh, we're all very happy they're around to be, you know, they have that visionary view. And so we're really pleased. The last thing I want to say before I introduce her is that no, we work very hard on the public talks because you may know that sometimes we researchers have difficulty sharing our science with the public. And so we get someone in here who can really do a good job on that. And normally I know ahead of time exactly what's going to be said in the talk, but this is a brand new talk. So I'm going to be part of the, inter the audience with you. I'll be, every word will be new to me. Um, I'm very excited. She said that this was an opportunity to give a talk that she'd always wanted to give. So um, welcome Julianne to, to the Kaufman Lecture. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I think this is my first in-person talk since well before COVID, so it's very nice to be back amongst you. And uh, as Evan said, this is not going to be talking about something that is like the core of my research program for which I am known. This is very much a passion project. Uh, actually, let me take this off. Um, so I want to talk about the, the, the weirdest galaxies in the universe. And so I am first going to talk about normal galaxies. Wah, 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 wah. Okay. And so, um, you know, we love galaxies. And, you know, these are the kinds of things the normal galaxies, these are our screensavers. We put them on, you know, there's stickers on our phone cases. Um, and, you know, I got to get you oriented to what normal looks like so that you can understand, like, why the ones that I think are weird are just so absolutely delightful. So this is a compendium of what we call spiral galaxies, uh, where astronomers are often not very creative in naming things. Like this is pretty obvious why we would call these spiral galaxies. And this is a compendium of like pretty normal, vanilla, everyday spiral galaxies. Uh, there's a kind of another generic class of galaxies. So these things you see a lot of. Um, there's another class of galaxies. They're much harder to find pictures of on the internet. These are elliptical, like, why do you think? <laughs> These are a lot less picturesque. There are many fewer things. And I, I took to Twitter to complain about the fact that like, I am really not finding great pictures of elliptical galaxies on the internet. And a long-term collaborator of Evan and mine um, pointed out that <laughs> he's somebody who works with some very large surveys. And <laughs> He said, well, like these. And so uh, he provided me with a set of these boring galaxies. And so these are called elliptical galaxies. They tend to be very featureless, really quite different. But, you know, they're, they turns out, as I'll show you, they're kind of on a continuum with these spiral galaxies. The one Hubble image I could easily find was on there because the spiral galaxy had photobombed it. <laughs> like that was the thing that made it possible. So um, I, I want to go back to, this is a quote, I, I've heard it attributed to a variety of astronomers in slight different variations. And it's that galaxies are like people, they're only normal until you get to know them. Um, and, and so that's true. And I will, you know, I'll talk a little bit about this, but what I actually want to talk about with is that, you know, we have among us as humanity, incredible visionaries and individuals that the way that they present themselves to the world teaches you something about humans and art and how we think about things. And that, you know, you don't have to get to know them in depth to really start to see that this is somebody who has a point of view and is going to give me insights about things. And so I'm going to try to lead to you today to the galaxy versions of these kinds of people. So if you go back to this you know, nice array of galaxies. You see, I've got the little box saying spiral galaxy. I was hiding something because in the middle of there, it's like, what's that? Okay. And, you know, that's a different, okay? And so different for scientists, like you know, they, there's a, this is another old saw that I don't know who said it, which is that, you know, people think science starts with Eureka, but really it tends to start with, that's funny. Right, that you see something a little bit weird and then you wonder what's going on with that. And this is, if you pull back and you take a big image, this is the heart of a pair of galaxies known as the antennae galaxies. Now this is really weird. This doesn't look anything like those galaxies that you, you saw before. And so obviously you can look at this and say something interesting is happening. I don't, maybe, maybe I don't understand it right yet, but this is going to be interesting. The other thing, 
is that, you know, a lot of galaxies, these ones that can look kind of normal, like they may actually have some sort of hidden history. So uh, this couple of just very nice, they look like it could be just a nice Minnesota couple. Um, yeah, this was the couple from Woodstock. It was a very famous picture of Woodstock. Like that's them, right? Like you'd see them, you walk in the Walmart parking lot, you say hi to them at Costco, but like, you know, they had a past, okay? And so there's galaxies you can see, like my boring elliptical galaxies that like, you know, they may have been doing this at a different time of their life. Okay, so, um, you know, astronomers are like scientists like to put stuff into boxes and we like to classify things. We like to find order among disorder. And so normal galaxies, people have put into a kind of nice systemizing system, which is, hold on, I'm going to do a little baby work here. Okay. Um, so, People have ordered, uh, let's see, I don't know if I can do, does this have a, I'm scared to push this. So I'm gonna see if that's a, no, I'm okay, I'm not even gonna try. Okay, <laughs> so this is a collection of, you can take all these sort of normal-ish galaxies that we see, and we can kind of order them into a sequence, where on the one side, you've got the boring elliptical, Okay, and then you get ones where they get a little bit less elliptically and a little more spirally as you go along. And sometimes they're circular, other times they have bars kind of in the middle and they're somewhat less boring. Okay, so, okay, so like, you know, this is amazing and this is a huge fact of nature. And honestly, we're still trying to understand why galaxies behave in this kind of nice systematic way. Um, but there's a lot more questions to ask and so, this is, so this is kind of where this is, I'm gonna be talking a lot about the work of this guy, Halton Chip Arp, okay? And so Chip took a look at these kind of normal ways of, of doing things and he kind of went off script and he developed his Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies, which I think is the greatest name for anything ever, except for possibly the catalog of flat galaxies, which I also really like. Um, so, Sometimes, so, okay, space is really big, in case you haven't heard, and there were times, young people, before the internets, and you couldn't just dial up, I want to look at some random part of the sky, and so there was this huge project in the middle of the 1900s, where this large area telescope um, at Palomar Mountain in, um, uh, in California, basically did an all sky survey of the Northern hemisphere. And this was the Palomar Sky Survey, took place kind of about over 10 years. And they produced these big, large scale sheets of, um, of prints showing the night sky. And then people would sit there with their little, uh, it's like kind of like a jeweler's loop with a little magnifying glass. And you'd sit there and you would just kind of like scan around and look at it. And so um, during this time, so people would, finally get a chance to actually look at the whole sky and people started taking notes about what they were saw. And so um, this one guy, Vronstov, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna say this right, Avel Yamanov, um, he basically looked at all of these and came up with a list of about 200 galaxies he thought were kind of cool. And then, um, so what ARP did is he took these galaxies and ARP had access to the Caltech 200 inch telescope, which is one of the largest telescopes at the time. Um, and so he did a lot of work, actually, he would take this list, he'd go he'd take really kind of deep images of them, and then try to figure out. So he went through the list, and a lot of them were just not actually that interesting, or it was a defect on the plate. And so he kind of culled through it, making these kind of deeper images of it. Then he'd like start asking his friends, like, hey, have you seen something interesting? And other people had had the list of like, yeah, every time I saw something cool, I keep a list on it. And so he started just assembling this whole list of interesting things. And so you can kind of see this is sort of like a state of the art image. Sometimes you'll see things where it's kind of black on white and that's like a negative image. Um, and often when you print things that way, you can kind of see fine details. So this is that same antennae galaxy that I showed you earlier, um, you know, compared to kind of a modern view of it. So, um, so in the preface of his book, of, of this catalog, he said, you know, and this is, I think, a, an absolute, this is a very actually deeply insightful view of this. As he said, you know, if we could analyze a galaxy in the laboratory, we would deform it, shock it, probe it in order to discover its properties. We can't do that. We can't go out there and like hit it with a hammer. Like that's not, 
sadly. I would be into it. Um, okay, the peculiarities of the galaxies pictured in this atlas represent perturbations, deformations, and interactions which should enable us to analyze the nature of the real galaxies which we observe and which are too remote to experiment on directly. In general, the more conspicuous the peculiarity, the more illustrative it is of special events and reactions that occur in galaxies. So it's this idea that you can take something like that very smooth organization where it's clearly obeying a bunch of physical laws, but then you look at all these things that violate it. And then you use that as a way to try to understand things. So I think this is a really very interesting way about trying to deal with scientific problems and especially things where truly we as astronomers can only look, we can't go visit. We have to kind of make a lot of inferences just based upon what we can see. So he built this collection initially of, you know, 330 something galaxies. Um, and he started because astronomers like to try to find order out of disorder. And so he started kind of classifying it into various groups. And so he developed this whole kind of taxonomy of these things. And uh, I'm just gonna walk you through what some of these things look like. So some of them, yeah, you know, it's a little, like, is it that peculiar? So these are things where it has a split arm. So he was kind of that on the right-hand side, you see how it's got like a little wishbone sort of thing. And so yeah, he thought that was interesting. And so he, he put that in there. You know, this is another one where it's got one heavy arm. I don't really see that it's got one heavy arm, but it's a little lopsided. It's not so, not so symmetric, okay? But then it's like, well, that's pretty weird, right? So these are things where, uh, so he has spiral galaxies and then things where he has companions on arms. And then these are ones where it has small high surface brightness companions. So I think it's that galaxy that's kind of at the very top there he thought might be associated with this. And you can see like that's, that's definitely something that's kind of different. Uh, then here's another one where this, uh, you know, so this is the kind of source imaging that he was dealing with down here on the bottom left. And then on the right is sort of a modern Hubble Space Telescope multicolor view of it. And you can see that, you know, things are starting to get really incredibly complex. Um, Here's, yeah, I, I'm just showing you these things. I just, I, I, we could just sit here and I could just do this for like more than an hour, but we're not gonna do it. We're not gonna do it for a full hour. Uh, so, you know, here's another one where he says that the companion is like an elliptical galaxy and you can kind of see it looks like a boring elliptical and then a spiral galaxy. And then like, this is the wreckage after the party that they had, like this is definitely Sunday morning in the <laughs> Right, there's, there's quite a mess. And again, you know, he was working off of these kinds of images where you couldn't necessarily tell nearly as much as you can from the modern images, but he was correctly identifying a lot of things that were particularly unusable. What's this? <laughs> right? Like, I mean, this is, this is absolutely, this is absolutely incredible. And this is going on to something where the main galaxy is what he thinks is an elliptical, but he thinks it's connected to a spiral, but it's also doing much, much more. Uh, here's another thing where it's elliptical close to and perturbing a spiral galaxy. So that's a spi So spiral galaxies are probably like Frisbees and you kind of see it edge on and then things are looking a little different there. Uh, then you start getting these things that have these giant filaments coming off of them, right? So here's a spiral galaxy and then it's just got a tail for reasons. Um, then you have galaxies like this, where they, these are two galaxies, but you can see they're connected by a bridge. Like if you just took pictures of either one of them, you might not say it was that weird, but the fact that they are connected is interesting. You have things like this, where they're really, they're very cute, right? This is kind of, uh, you know, and there's, this is definitely at least three galaxies, whether that third galaxy is an interloper or is just kind of a bystander passing through, we don't really know. And so, this is, you know, I'm showing you all of these to kind of give you a sense about just how interesting this collection of galaxies is. So the, so the way that I first, I first got interested in these in, I want to say like 1996. So there is, um, I, I was at Carnegie Observatories and one of the senior astronomers there unfortunately passed away in a tragic accident. Um, but one of the things that happens is when a senior astronomer passes away, 
usually they've collected a lifetime worth of books and journals and papers and astronomic memorabilia. And then that usually gets kind of recirculated within the community. And so, um, so my colleague had a copy, one of those little blue copies of Hulk's, of you know, the Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies. And that was the first time I'd ever really looked at this. Like, I think I'd maybe heard of them. And then I just started looking through it and it was just like, my God, what is that, right? I mean, page after page after page. And I was someone who always loved galaxies and I had just never seen anything like this. And again, this was really like, there wasn't a whole lot of internet at that point. Like we weren't saturated in, in this kinds of thing. And so this was just for me, this very transformative thing looking at them. So I, I had a very early love affair and then I'd always kind of cared about it, but never really done anything. And I'll show you later on about some of the stuff that I've been doing with it. So. You know, I want to get back to kind of the heart of this quote from him, which is that, you know, these weird systems should help us to understand something about how real galaxies behave. Now, um, you know, Ark was somebody who was not afraid to, uh, you know, he was a very original thinker. And, um, you know, his take on this, and this kind of relates to um, uh, Vronsa Veliaminov, Vel Vel who had come up with that sort of original 200 list of 200 galaxies, which had kind of gotten ARP started, um, that they really thought that this might have something to do with magnetic field. Radio astronomy was becoming a big deal, and they had started to identify that there was gas in space that might be have loose electrons in it, and that makes it a plasma, and plasmas interact with magnetic fields, and they saw all these like weird connections and stuff, so they thought maybe it had something to do with magnetic fields. Um, you know, and so here's like a magnet and you can see the iron filings are tracing out these magnetic fields. And then you look at these galaxies and you can kind of see these sort of wispy connective structures. And so it's not, they, it, you know, it wasn't unreasonable to look at this stuff and see that it might have, ag you know, evidence for magnetism. And if you look at old conference proceedings, so it used to be that when you went to a conference, they'd often publish a book afterwards where people would write up um, you know, things about their talk. And then sometimes they would capture discussion in the afterwards. They would say, Evan Skillman asked Julianne Dalcanton, this seems ridiculous. Why do you think you're right? And I would say, Evans, shut up and sit down, right? Like, you know, so like that would get captured. And so you could see at that time that, um, you know, I was looking at one of these things and, I, and I've never been able to find out which one it was, but you could see the whole back and forth as people were trying to figure this out. Like maybe it's magnetic field. People really did not, they knew these things were interesting, but they hadn't yet taken that next step to really getting kind of physical understanding out of it. Um, and then in 1972, two brothers, uh, um, Alar and Yuri Tumre, I think Finnish, is that correct, Evan? I think they're Finnish. Um, but they did this, this really this very elegant paper called Galactic Bridges and Tails. And this is some of the very, very first work in simulations. This is 1972. And so what they did is they modeled a galaxy as just a ring of little points. So like they made a ring with like little point masses around it and then and centered on this blue thing. And then they had just a perturber. So they just took like another mass, which is this red thing and they ran it on an orbit past the galaxy. And then they watched at what happened to all of the little dots, okay? And so this is a time sequence. So one is, you know, before, zero, one, two, three, four, five. And so the only thing that's really operating here is gravity. There's no magnetic fields, there's no gas, there's no dark matter. This is just, I've got a ring of particles and I've got another massive thing going through. And what this is, is this is what's, what's you know, come to be known as tidal tails. So you know about tides on the earth. That happens because you've got like the earth and it's got like a layer of ocean around it. And then there's the moon. And the moon pulls more heavily on stuff that's close to it and less heavily on stuff that's far away from it. So the bit of the, the Earth's, uh, the bit of the ocean that's close to the moon kind of bulges out towards the moon. And the bit of the ocean that's far away from the moon doesn't feel as much of an effect and gets kind of left behind. So you wind up with this bulge of material. This is the same sort of thing, which is that as that red point, let, let's look at number zero. As that red point goes near the blue point, stuff on the one side gets drawn towards the red, 
and stuff that's far away gets kind of left behind, right? So everything, there's a range of gravitational forces. And so stuff gets pulled along. And then as this thing goes through, some of the material just kind of rips out, stretches out, and then other bits of it are kind of left behind. So they could take this and then just back it off. And they made these, you know, again, this is like very early days of computer graphics. Like, I mean, I think what they, they probably, they may have done this with a typewriter. It is not completely clear. Um, and then they classified it according to its eventual fate. And, you know, you can see that basically, well, okay. okay. I'm gonna take the hit. Um, <laughs> So basically everything that's an open circle was retained by the main galaxy. So it kind of held onto its stuff. Stuff that's in red got captured by the red point and is now part of the other, that other point mass. Okay, so there's been an exchange of material. These letter Bs on the bottom kind of form a connection between them. And then this T was this tidal tail, which was the stuff that was left behind. And you can see that exactly how this material distributes itself. It depends on where you were in the galaxy. It seems to be the effects are much bigger on the outskirts of galaxies than the insides. And it's like the insides is where the gravitational forces are much stronger. And so it's the outsides that are less weakly bound to the galaxy. And those are more likely to get pulled off. And so this was this paper was just, uh, I, I mean, I, it's ridiculously hugely cited because this is something that really took something where a year before they're like magnetic field i don't know and it's like oh it's gravity okay it really was an absolutely transformative picture it was not magnets well, well. okay um and so you know the, the arp atlas is filled with these kinds of systems that have these large tidal tails associated with them and so really all of a sudden this was all explained now Obviously, um, modern simulations can do this much, much better. So this is a simulation from kind of the last decade where it's got all the bells and whistles and you can see it's forming the tidal tails. They've also run this simulation much, much longer. So we're just gonna watch this for a bit. And so you can see the morphologies of these things get really complex, right? It's a relatively simple starting system, but um, the degree of interaction is, you know, you can't really calculate any of this from first principles. You have to put the rules of physics into a computer and then let it run. But you can see for these two galaxies, they are eventually merging fully together in this particular case. They don't always, like if they, if they had passed each other further away, pardon me, they might have just kind of kept flying, but just been disturbed. But this is something where they leave behind something that's starting to look like my boring elliptical galaxy. So these are, this process of interaction is something where it can make these very, very dramatic views during, but then the end products can be quite different from the input. So this is a really very, very different way of thinking about how do we get the galaxies that we that we see today, um, and so you know this idea of I mean, two rays. People have talked about like sort of a two ray sequence, which is the idea that so these are actual galactic galactic systems. Okay, space has very very long time scales, so like you can't look out and watch a galaxy transform from one to another. We can't look at two interacting galaxies and then just you know, grab some popcorn and then wait and see what happens. Like we have, so this is something where you can make these composites where you take galaxies in different stages and you can just kind of you know, take a tour of your imagination and say that I can imagine a sequence that kind of leads you through this. Um, there's a beautiful bit of animation um, that was done by Space Telescope when they released a large number of, H of Hubble Space Telescope images of these things where they did a simulation and then rotated it and showed how this one simulation could actually wind up explaining. So this is going back and forth between simulated galaxies and then actual observed galaxies that are remarkably similar. So hold on. It's really, right? This is just one interaction and all of these different morphologies are kind of coming out of it. All right, so there's the tidal tails, and then you can see the bridge of material. Now they're starting to coalesce. All 
I normally turn off the music for these things, but this should probably have had, this should have had music. That was stupid. But, right, and you can get to a point, like if you see something like that, you might not recognize it instantly as two galaxies, but it very much is. And then I think, are they gonna wind up with, okay. I think that's it on that. Okay, so, um, you know, so like I was drawn, you know, as a young scientist, I was drawn to the ARP galaxies just because they were really, really cool. Um, and I, I think there, there are, in addition, there, there's definitely some sort of higher order reasons to look at these things. I think that um, gradually over, and this is probably something over the last 20 or so years, um, I think people have come to a realization that this particular mode of galaxies interacting is a really important driver of a lot of what we see in the universe over cosmic time that these so there's the arp systems where they were chosen because of their morphology and how they looked and then they can study their properties at the same time there's this whole class of galaxies which are called ultra luminous infrared galaxies you don't have to worry about what any of that means except for maybe ultra luminous and these are some of the most energetic galaxies in the universe and when they train the Hubble Space Telescope at them, they see things like this, that if you actually look at them, it turns out you would have happily put them in the ARP Atlas. They absolutely belong there. So when we look at these galaxies that are super, super energetic, a lot of their morphologies say that, you know, these are things that this kind of mode of interaction is something that's very important. And there's arguments that these kinds of ultra luminous galaxies, that this is some of the ways that most of the stars in the universe form was through these kinds of short events rather than that nice normal behavior that we are seeing. And I, I think that the, the, the way to think about this is that fundamentally, like these are galaxies that are out of equilibrium. Those normal galaxies are systems where they're doing their nice steady day-to-day -day thing. It's, you know, like, for like thrillers or whatnot, or mo movies that you see on TV, they always start with like the family and they're getting the kids off to school or whatnot. And then all of a sudden everything starts to happen. Like you can learn a lot about people in their day to day and how they choose to live their lives. But then there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens when things go out of equilibrium and stuff is no longer exactly the same as it was. And so these are ways of really probing those extremes about when things are no longer self-regulating themselves to kind of look like these nice stable systems. Um, so for, to kind of expand on this idea, I'm gonna have to teach you some stuff rather than just showing you the cool pictures, but I guarantee you it's gonna add a whole lot of richness to trying to look at some of these pictures and understand things. So, um, you know, I haven't really, I've shown you pictures of galaxies, but I haven't really told you like what's in a galaxy and there's, there's basically three major components that are gonna be relevant today for, for today's talk. And so these are gonna be stars, gas, and then dark matter. So stars, so this is um, this is a video. Let's see, is this gonna click? Okay, there we go. Um, so this is a video from um, some of the work that Evan was describing with the Andromeda galaxy. And so this is a vision of the, of the Milky Way and we're gonna zoom in on the Andromeda galaxy. All these spots are stars in the Milky Way. The Andromeda galaxy is right there. We're zooming, we're zooming, we're zooming, we're zooming. And there's all this light and it looks smooth, but then all of a sudden it starts to look grainy as we're getting into the Hubble Space Telescope images. And you can see that that graininess is not noise in your image. It's not like when you take an iPhone picture in the dark and it's just kind of crappy. This is something where this is the noise from the actual individual stars that are in there. So when we see most of the light in an optical, you know, a typical image that we would take with a home telescope, an astrophotographer, the Hubble Space Telescope, what we're actually looking at, the majority of what you see is actually individual stars, but just so many of them, they're all blended together and it looks smooth. And it's only if by doing very detailed kinds of things, can you maybe start to pick it out into the individual stars. So that's most of the light that you see. Now, in addition to the stars that you see, and you know, again, this is representing just a normal telescope taking these things. Um, there's also a very large component of gas. And so this gas, we need typically special equipment to be able to see. So these are things like, this is the very large array in New Mexico. So if you've seen contact, you know, those, that's the kind of thing. So you often need to look at very different wavelengths. And so this is, these are, you know, I would, I would call this stuff up top images and the bottom, I would call those more maps. So these are sort of maps of 
where we detect the gas in the galaxies. And you can see that the gas has some structural similarities to what's going on with the stars. Um, generally, the gas tends to be a little bit more extended. It tends to be a little bit clumpier, but um, it's also a very significant component and plays a big role in the behavior of galaxies. Now, all of these things, both, the, both that kind of gas and the stars tend to all fall in a sort of similar sorts of structure. So most of the gas and stars in a spiral galaxy are in the disk. There's, um, which this is a face, this is like a, a view from the top, and then the other one is a view from the side. There is also this kind of this component in the middle that's known as the bulge, and it's more like a little boring elliptical that got, you know, dolled itself up for the party with its nice spiral arms. And so most of the gas is kind of in that disk, and then the stars are in that central bulge and also, also the disk. Um, there's also a component of dark matter. I don't have any good pictures of the dark matter. <laughs> I have artist renditions and computer simulations of plenty. So the way you should think about the dark matter is that the parts that you can see or that you can detect as stars or gas is usually embedded in what we call a dark matter halo. It's much more extended um, around, around pretty much every galaxy you see. So here's, um, this is on the right is a computer simulation of dark matter and then um, I very technically adjusted my PowerPoint so that I put the Andromeda galaxy in it. That's not actually Andromeda's thing. But so this dark matter halo, it's more extended. There's a big smooth component, but there are also lots of little things in it. So we think that our best model of dark matter, it's pretty clumpy. And that we think that a lot of the dark matter assembles hierarchically, like it starts little things merged together to form bigger things, which move together to form bigger things. And because of that, that's why this whole being interested in merging and interacting galaxies is really interesting because we think that like there is the dark matter drives things to be merging together throughout cosmic history. So we can see it in the ARPs happening right now, but we think it's a generic feature of galaxy formation. So um, this is a beautiful simulation by the Eagle thing where they're zooming in on the whole structure of dark matter and going into an individual little galaxy and showing the gas and the stars. And now we're like unrolling the movie backwards. Okay, so this is kind of showing in reverse how that individual galaxy formed. See, do you see that clump that just kind of flew by, right? That was something that had come in and merged relatively recently. So that gives you a kind of sense. And so our understanding of these things come from fundamental physics from simulations where we put the rules of the universe as best we know them in a computer, and then we kind of see what happens. Now, um, for the rest of this talk, what I want you to think about is that the, the, it's, it's really key to think about the fact that the stars and the dark matter and the gas, they all move in very, very different ways. Well, okay, somewhat different ways. So, um, so the dark matter, as far as we know, all it does is just, it follows gravity. We, what we know about it is it has mass and whatever kinds of interactions it has are with anything else, including itself, is not very important on the scale of galaxies. And so, or the larger universe as a whole. And so that's, a, so this is a simulation just showing kind of this larger network of dark matter and then galaxies are like formed at the really little dense points in it. Um, but what happens is you see all this stuff moving around, but as far as we know, dark matter doesn't like hit other pieces of dark matter. So it's kind of like, you know, I live in New York City right now, and you can have a very busy street and stuff. People can be going in all different directions and nobody hits each other because you'd get yelled at. So, um, <laughs> but, you know, think, you know, people, you can go by, you can be dense, you can move in different directions, but nothing's ever going to hit. And that's kind of a good model for dark matter. So that like when dark matter collides with other things of dark matter, it's not really a collision. They just kind of pass through each other like two crowds that are ignoring each other on a city street. Um, however, for most of, for galaxies, most of the mass is actually in the dark matter. So in terms of the behavior that we see, a lot of that is controlled by what the dark matter is doing. And that's a way the tumor and tumor work in the early 70s, we didn't really know about dark matter then. And so that's a big difference between those modern simulations I showed and that early work is that modern ones know that there's dark matter that's kind of controlling a lot of things. But, um, so it's kind of amazing that tumor and tumor were able to get it that close to correct, even when they, we didn't actually know what dark matter was. Okay. So, um, 
Now the stars have many similarities to the dark matter in terms of how they move. So this is a simulation. So there was a press release, I don't know, it was probably like 15 years ago, because saying, oh no, Andromeda is going to merge with the Milky Way. And people are like really anxious, like it's going to be really bad. And the thing is, sp space is super empty. Like the Milky Way, it's really far between us and the nearest star. It is, if the nearest star were like a football field away, like the amount of space our sun takes up is like a tiny, tiny fraction of a millimeter, okay? So stars can move past each other. So the dark matter drags them around. The stars go along for the ride in the same way that the dark matter doesn't collide, the stars don't really collide either in, you know, outside of very, very exceptional circumstances. So, you know, Milky Way and Andromeda merge, we will just kind of continue to go along. Our skies will get really interesting for a while, like the night sky is gonna look pretty cool, but um, it's not really, you know, it's not really going to affect anything about the solar system. Um, gas is really the opposite of all of these things. Like gas is, is a real, uh, that's, okay. Gas interacts with other gas with, with glee and abandon and just generic chaos. So gas can be at a whole range of temperatures. Gas can be nearly absolute zero. Gas can be millions of degrees. Gas interacts with other gas all the time, very, very happily. And so gas affects the motion of other gas really, really easily. Gas can be affected by light. If I shine a light bulb, if I take a really hot light bulb, a space light bulb, like a star, and I shine it at another star, it's not really gonna affect what happens to that star. If I take a really luminous star and I shine it on a blob of gas, the gas is gonna be like, oh, I'm hot. Oh, I'm gonna make a plasma. Like it completely changes itself. So gas is just super, super interactive. It interacts with light. It interacts with itself. It feels pressure forces. So whatever happens in the evolution of gas is always vastly more complicated in terms of the restructuring compared to what's going on with the dark matter and the stars. So if you think about those interacting galaxies, the way you can think about it is that if you were to wipe away the gas, you'd see evolution that would look a lot like that tomb ray and tomb ray interaction, which was kind of just pure gravity stuff moving around. As soon as you put gas into it, everything gets really messy because then all of a sudden gas is gonna interact with gas and a lot of things are gonna happen. Okay, so when I look at images as an astronomer, I have a lot of just kind of shorthand in my head that allows me to look at an image and figure out a lot about the physical conditions without firing up a computer to run simulate. Like I'm at an institute now where there's people who are wizards at doing numerical simulations of galaxies and whatnot, but it's very expensive. It takes a lot of time to set them up. Um, it's a real pain in the butt. Um, and so you can actually get a lot of the answer just by looking at something. And so I wanna share with you like, a kind of some ways that you can take when you see the next great JWST release or the next Hubble release that you can look at it and try to understand what's going on. And then we're going to look at some more ARP galaxies with, oh, sorry, uh, you know, with this new knowledge. Okay. So uh, what can I tell about the dark matter from looking at an image? About the same as you could tell before. Uh, you know, if you could see how, if you could measure how stuff was moving, you could figure some stuff out, but just by looking at it, not so much. Okay, stars, stars are, I love stars. So stars are really interesting and they're very, very useful fig for figuring out ages of things. So this is a picture of a globular cluster um, taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see that there's a wide range, a wide range of colors associated with that. Some are red, some are blue. And particularly when you look at all the stars blended together, you're often dominated by what's the brightest typical star. And if the brightest typical stars are blue, it's gonna look blue. If the brightest typical stars are red, it's gonna look red. So I'm gonna just give you some kind of shorthand. So this is the um, constellation of Orion. It's a winter constellation. The leaves fall down from the trees. If you can stand being outside in the Minnesota winter for like more than a minute and let your eyes get adapted, you'll probably be able to see Orion relatively soon. And what I want you to note, so he's got manly shoulders. He's got a tiny little head, poor guy. He's got a belt, he's got a sword. He's wearing a little Grecian skirt. Um, but you can see like, if you look at his two shoulders, do you see how different those colors of those stars are? I mean, and yes, this has been tur turned up to the lurid setting, but um, you know, with your eyes, you can actually sometimes just tell these things just, just looking at this. 
Okay, so stars are different colors, um, even just in our own night sky. And the way to think about this is that the, the outskirts of stars are what we call an ionized plasma. So they're, they're pretty hot, but ionized plasmas are not that different from some of the effects that you see with like a flame. Um, and so when I have a flame like this, you know, we, you know how we say like things are red hot? It, the hottest part of this is actually the blue stuff, right? Like it's actually more like white hot. So the hot stuff is down there. The cool stuff is up there. And what this means is that because we sort of know how these things behave, I can actually just look at these stars and I can tell you something about what temperature the surface of those stars are, which is kind of amazing. I don't have to take a space thermometer and go there. I can just look at the kind of light it emits, take what I know about the behavior of light and gas at very high, at, you know, high temperatures. And you know, I can tell you something about those temperatures. And it turns out that generally when I'm dealing with older groups of stars, the brightest stars are much cooler. And so they look redder. And when I'm dealing with groups of stars that formed recently, the most luminous stars tend to be very luminous and also very, very blue. So generally, if I see a part of a galaxy that looks pretty blue, it's like, oh, those are a bunch of stars that formed relatively recently. And if I see a part where the stars are relatively, where the light's relatively red, usually that means I've got a pretty good population of these older stars. So uh, this is, I believe this is the mice again. And so just by eye, you can see there's a range of colors in the galaxies. And so those inner regions that look a little bit more like the boring elliptical galaxies, but with frosting, like those are probably older stars. And then you can see out on the spiral tails, it's a lot bluer. Those are probably newer stars. Okay, so like, again, I didn't have to do any fancy analysis. I could just look at this and kind of figure out roughly. Like, I can't tell you exactly how many giga years older or younger, but I can, you know, I can get a good short answer there. Okay, gas, gas is a little bit harder because as I said, like a lot of the ways in which we detect gas are not just using visual equipment. It's using things, you know, observations of radio waves or submillimeter waves. It's a little bit more complicated, but there's also a bunch of little cheats that you can use to sort of figure out whether gas is playing a role or has been around. Um, and so I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go through all three of these. Um, so the first one is dust. So get space dust space gas it's very very dirty okay it's got dust in it not a whole lot like not a whole lot by mass but basically you have all of this gas in the galaxy and there's a little bit of kind of almost soot particulates and these are things that are produced by stars in their evolution or supernova and it's just a tiny little bit of dirt that's basically embedded in the gas and everywhere the gas goes this dirt goes along with it so what this does is does the, the, this dusty gas, it does the, the dust does the same thing as if you had dust on your windshield or dust on your glasses, and it blocks your view of what's behind this. And so you can see all these black patches. These are not holes in the galaxy. These are places where there's a lot of dust that's keeping you from seeing much or further into this. And so I don't need to have a fancy telescope, big radio scale telescope to tell me that there is a lot of kind of cold, dense gas in these systems and where it is, is because I can just look where these sort of dusty patches are and have a pretty good idea about where the kind of cold gas is distributed. And so that's pretty, that, that saved me a lot of time. And I can just, I can just, so that's kind of above, that's from the side. Um, you can also see this if you ever, I don't know how many of you have, have um, you know, gone camping or something or gone to a place that's relatively dark and stayed out long enough to be able to see the Milky Way arching across the sky. You know, you can see this, these black lines in there, and those are actually the Dutch dust patches in the Milky Way. So again, we're living in a frisbee of gas and stars. And so from within it, we, there's a lot of dust along the line of sight, and that's what makes that structure. So if we go back to these guys, you can see that there's a lot of evidence for this sort of dusty, dense gas. Now, the one limitation with this, though, is that it does require that you have background light that you're looking at to kind of see. So it needs a backlight. So you could have dust that's like well down below, but because there aren't bright stars behind it, you couldn't really know. So that's one limitation of this. Okay, so there's another trick you can use to sort of figure out is gas playing a role in my system, and that's to look for lumps, okay? That if you have lumps in a galaxy, you usually get lumps of something that's associated with... Um, with gas. So if we go back to the Orion Nebula, so he's got his little sword here. Um, I don't know if you can see, like, do you see like there's kind of a pinkish blob 
down there. And so with constellations, we think it's all stars. But actually, um, this is this is an image where they've taken an image through what's called a they've looked at a very specific wavelength of light and they plotted it as red. And that's something that highlights very, you know, pretty hot, like 10,000 degree gas that's associated with it. And you can see that that part of what you think is a star in the constellation is actually a blob of gas associated with it. Um, and this is known as the Orion Nebula. Okay. And if we zoom in, now this is something that, again, you may have seen as a screen saver or something in one part of your life. And so this is an area where there's lots of new stars that are forming. So gas is the fuel for forming new stars. It's basically the engine that kind of keeps stars continually being born inside of a galaxy. And when stars are born, they're very hot. And their being hot tends to create these very colorful nebula of very... So the gas is cold, it makes a star, the star is very hot, it heats the gas because gas is messy, and then you get these big, beautiful, colorful nebula. So the existence of these kinds of like clumpy, bright optical nebula is also a sign that you've recently formed stars, and if you've recently formed stars, you formed them out of something, and so you formed it out of gas. Um, the other thing you can do is, so this is a beautiful Hubble image, zooming in on this. And then I wanna actually show you these forming stars. So on the um, left-hand panel is just showing a close-up, And then on the right-hand panel is showing if instead of looking with kind of the wavelengths of light that we see with our eyes, we look at the near infrared. So this is kind of more getting to where you would maybe, well, it's not quite all the way to using night vision goggles, but it's a little bit more that way. Um, and you can see that on the optical, we can't see very far into here. But in the infrared, we can see all the way through so that it, we can see through that dust and we see all these individual stars. And these are all those newly formed stars. If you wait a while, those new stars are gonna destroy the gas that's around it. And they're gonna form these, these knots of stars, these stellar clusters. And so that happens relatively quickly in a galaxy kind of time scale. Um, and then those clusters, most of them don't last all that long. So if you see lumps in a galaxy, you're either picking up one of these nebula that's being heated by really hot stars, or you're picking up one of these clusters, what they call these stellar clusters of recently formed stars. So anytime you see those lumps, that's a sign there's probably been very, very recent star formation, and that tells me that I had some gas. Okay, so if we go back to this image, can you already spot where some of those kind of lumpy clusters are, right? So there's lots in there. There's some that are also in there. Some of the, a couple of these, when you get far out, it's a little hard to tell whether it's a background galaxy or not. Um, but this is telling you that you've got very recent star formation and that there's gas. And so this is something you can use even when you don't have something that's really backlit. Okay, so this is another thing. Now you can also see that there's big parts of this galaxy where you don't see any lumpiness. So in those older stellar regions, and so those are regions that probably don't have that much gas outside of where that dust is, okay? So the final thing, and this is kind of cool, is that because gas loves to slam into other bits of gas and it feels these forces that the stars and the dark matter don't, is that you can also look for signs that something's rammed into something else. So um, on the advertisement for, for this talk is, is, is the penguin galaxy, that's its egg. It's really cute. Okay, <laughs> like I mean, right? Like it's, it's just adorable. But it's also really, really weird, okay? So like, let's start looking at some of these things that we know about that, okay? So there's young blue stars. So these are the newly formed blue stars. We've got lots of dense, dusty gas. But, you know, it doesn't, like the, the gas and the stars aren't really lining up with each other. They're kind of offset. And then there's this weird wide fan. It's not this like thin streak, like in Tumre Tumre, like, so there's some extra stuff that's going on there. Um, so this is showing you a view where it's, this is, it's a really cool visualization. So it's a simulation and what they did is they did like a split screen. So down below, it's just showing you the dark matter. On the upper side, they're showing you all the hot gas. And this is all of this like intergalactic gas, but a lot of it tends to gather around galaxies. And we think this is a byproduct of a lot of aspects of the formation of galaxies. And this is gas that's like millions of degrees. It's hotter than anything I've, showing you it's very hard to detect. Like you can, it's uh, like, we see it in the simulations and so we're really convinced that it's there, but the observational signatures for it are incredibly elusive. But gas that's, that's that hot 
really should have an effect on other gas. That if, if something rams into that, um, do you remember PV equals NRT for those of you who are like, who have like blocked all of your chemistry, like pressure scales with temperatures. So the hotter the gas, the higher the pressure. So this really hot gas can exert enormous pressures on other bits of gas that happen to run into it. So those kinds of simulations help us think that there's probably that, especially that elliptical galaxy probably has this big halo of very hot million degree high pressure gas. And so the penguin, when it rammed through this hot halo of gas, a lot of the gas that was in that galaxy got kind of pushed, right, and spread out. And it's not really obeying that pure tumor and tumor. And it means that the stars get to do something a little different from the gas because the gas is feeling different forces than the stars and the dark matter. And so you can start to see sometimes some of these disassociations between what the gas signatures are doing and what the stars are doing. That's another sign. And so, like, again, I said this is really hard stuff to see. But like you can look at an image and actually make some inferences that there is probably something there. And I think that's really nifty. So, um, so you can learn a tremendous amount just from looking at an image, a lot, of, a lot of stuff. But to do this, a lot of what I've been showing you are Hubble Space Telescope images. And that's because you need really exquisite resolution. So um, if I take off my glasses, y'all do not look very interesting, okay, right? If I put them on, you know, you're all much more beautiful to look at. And it's the same thing with telescopes. So these, you know, the images from the original art catalog were done with this 200 inch telescope on the ground. The air's moving around all the time. The Hubble Space Telescope is in space. There's no air. There's none of that sort of swirly mirage or the twinkling that you see of stars. And so you get these incredibly crisp images of things. And you can see just how much more detail you get. So, Okay, so this was the situation. This has been the situation. Okay, the other thing that happens is when there's a new space telescope, everybody wants to look at their favorite object. Okay, we're going to look at the antennae some more. You just saw the pillars of creation image with James Webb with the JWST thing that just got released. That's because they took pictures of that with the Hubble Space Telescope, and so people wanted to look at it with JWST. So like this happens. Like we keep looking at the same thing and the same thing and the same thing. There are literally thousands of peculiar galaxies that were cataloged by ARP. And then in the 80s, um, him and a postdoc, Barry Medor, classified a whole bunch in the Southern Hemisphere because all of a sudden there was enough imaging. So there are literally thousands of these things and not that many of them have ever been looked at with Hubble. So this is, I think this is wrong. So, uh, so, <laughs> Evan, Evan talked about my propensity to take advantage of calls to use the Hubble Space Telescope. So the Hubble Space Telescope orbits the Earth. And because of that, it can't use all of that because sometimes it's like too near the sun. Yeah, it's pointing towards the sun, so you can't do anything. You can only do stuff in the shade. And it's taking this complicated order, orbit around the Earth. Um, and so sometimes in those orbits, it doesn't have very long periods where it can look at something. And so it used to be that it was dormant during those periods. They were like, ah, it's too short. We can't really do any science with it. But then they said, you know, maybe we could do some science with it. Are there any ideas you have to do something with this? And, I, and they, they needed something where you weren't saying, I want to look at this one object at this particular time. I'm like, you know, there's a thousand peculiar galaxies in the ARP atlases. And anytime you had one of these little short orbits, maybe you could take a look at it. And so this is known as proposal 15446. There is, it has an enthusiastic Twitter and Flickr following of astrophotographers who take this, all this data is public. They take it and then they make images of these things because it's just like every single thing is guaranteed to be really cool in some kind of way. It's like my favorite thing ever, okay? There's science experiments you do where it's like, I've got a very rigorous plan from this to this important scientific thing. And this was like, these are really cool and we should look at them, right? Because I want to like expand, like everybody keeps looking at the antennae, like JWST should be looking at things besides the antennae. So um, I'm gonna show you first a bunch of these black and white images. So we only took one, these are very short orbits. You can't take multicolor pictures. We just take one exposure. Um, there's this wonderful amateur astrophotographer, um, Judy Schmidt. She doesn't, I don't think she really does takes pictures, but she's a very gifted processor of images. So she's just, you know, anytime a new image comes down, she had a long period where she was just scraping it up and then uh, taking images. She has a beautiful flicker. Uh, like she's, she's actually processing a lot of the JWS. She's actually 
formed a really good partnership with one of the teams doing JWST imaging of nearby galaxies and is doing a lot of their imaging. So I'm just going to show you some of these things that come down. So we've gotten hundreds of observations of new previously unobserved our galaxies. I want you to take your new knowledge about like what these different things are. So there's some nice merging galaxies. Here's an elliptical galaxy with some frosting. Uh, this thing looks like it's pooping other galaxies, honestly. And this is also like ARP really got, he was very disturbed. He actually thought that you had a lot of ejection of quasars out of the centers of other galaxies because he was an original thinker. Um, and so he would have probably been incredibly excited by this. Um, that's just a big old, this is actually the technical term for this among astronomers is a train wreck. Um, so if I said a train wreck galaxy, like the astronomers in the room would say, like, oh yeah, that. Um, here's like another one of these sort of spindles where there's something wrapped around something else. Um, this is a fantastic, so this is a kind of galaxy which is known as a collisional ring galaxy. So this is something where something that's kind of elliptical plowed through another galaxy and just sort of left a hole like throwing a rock in a, in a pool of water. Um, there are also chances that, you know, this, the, you can see all the lumps are on the one side and that center thing doesn't have any lumps, like that's a smooth thing. There, there could also be some of those hot halo of gas effects playing a role here, but you'd have to do a detailed simulation to see. Um, sometimes elliptical galaxies get really cool. They have all of this kind of complicated ringing as these stars on orbits are going in and out, in and out, in and out, and gradually sort of settling down like bouncing balls, kind of going doing, 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 doing. You get the same kind of behavior of stars going in and out of these mergers. Um, I love this galaxy. I just really, this is a galaxy where it's got like this little center bulge. And then this is a perfectly edge on disk that probably if you looked at it face on, I don't know that you could see it, right? It's just so incredibly huge and diffuse. And so I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with this one. Um, the other thing is, you know, NASA obviously very quickly recognized, and I put in the proposal, like these are gonna be really good public release things. And NASA and its companion, ESA, the European Space Agency have picked up on this. And they found ways to colorize these using ground-based data. So they get the colors from the ground-based data, but they use the resolution and the relative brightness from the HST data. Um, and so you can see something here. This looks kind of like the classic Whirlpool galaxy. You can see the star formation, right? So are you starting to see the lumps along the way connecting the two and the cold gas? So this is a lot like, for those of you who've seen the Whirlpool, this is a lot like that one. Um, you know, this is another standard kind of relatively late merger interaction. Um, yeah, but like these are systems that are, you can look at things besides the antennae, right? These are all now rel good candidates for further studies. Um, I love this one because it's got a little background pair in it that are also interacting. Um, is this going to go, I think, yeah, they made movies out of these things. So like if you, if, if you, oh, I don't know if you can, there we go. There's the sound. Right. Okay, I'm not going to belabor this. Uh, this one, I, I I love this one. Who knows what's going on? Like this this one, even using your tools to look at galaxy images, I don't think that really helps you anything. Like I can't. Like is it three galaxies, four or five? Like I don't I don't really know. All I know is I think it looks a lot like a bird. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, here's another one where it's got this sort of strong asymmetry to it. Okay, and I, I, I gotta get a little sciencey for a second. Is that there are a lot of these galaxies though where you are starting to see? I'm gonna show. You, there's a bunch of this one's just absolutely spectacular. Um, and you see how there's like it's pulled this line of gas out, but I think it may also still be going through a halo. I actually think that that small one came up through the bottom of that lower one, but then I think it's got that really hot halo. And so the gas is feeling an effect as, and the stars are moving through. So I think, you know, I'm seeing a lot of systems like this come through that I think really are strong evidence for these hot galaxy halos. And I think with some more detailed simulations, we're gonna be able to pull out an interesting thing. Here's a nice little close-up. I think it's really cool. Okay. Here's another one where, again, do you see that there's like, um, I don't know how well it's showing up. I don't think it dimmed the lights a little bit, but you can see there's some streamers that really are kind of connecting at the very end. Okay, this one. Oh. So, right, so ARP organized things into numbers 
The Penguin Galaxy is ARP 142. This is ARP 143. All the 140s, the low 140s are the coolest things in the ARP catalog because these are systems where you have like an elliptical galaxy-ish thing. So something that doesn't have gas interacting with something that does have gas, which means you can tell, unlike that poor bird galaxy where you don't know what's happening, you don't know what was associated with what, here we can pretty much point to everything that came with the one galaxy because the other galaxy probably only had a hot halo of gas. And you can see that again, there's still this same thing of pulling off some of the gas. And it's not so much that it's pulling off, it's more that that gas isn't free to go with. And it's actually made the other galaxy triangular. It's not like a collisional ring galaxy, it's a collisional triangle galaxy. We think there's an AGN, uh, an active galactic nuclei going up on the one on the right hand of all this matter falls on that center thing. Oh, it's a starship enterprise, right? Like. It's, <laughs> Like it really, but though somebody on the internet thought that it was a guy tossing pizza dough. And then once you see that, you can't see the, you can't see the Starship Enterprise, but I like the Starship Enterprise. So I put it there to keep your mind focused and do not get diverted by the pizza. Um, and then for Halloween, they, re <laughs> they released the face. I don't know if any of you guys saw this one, right? This, so this was another one where this was sitting there in the art catalog and the Hubble Space Telescope had never looked at this thing. Um, there, were, there were many arguments. I thought it should go this way, right? I thought that one was kind of too accusing. I think the one on the right is a lot more hopeful and optimistic, um, but I, I, I lost out because it was Halloween and so they went with the scary version of it. So this is probably another one of these collisional systems, except that instead of colliding with a galaxy that didn't have a bulge of old stars, it collided with a galaxy that did have a bulge. So it, it's got like two things. It's got like an elliptical and a bulge and that's what gets it. It's two scary or hopeful eyeballs. Um, okay, so what's next? I, I was like, everybody's gonna wanna hear about JWS. So I'm just going to just do two seconds on JWST. I know I'm going really long. So JWST, JWST's secret sauce is that it's, it's, it's looking at longer infrared wavelengths of light. As we've shown before, that allows you to look through the dust. So you can see into a lot of these like merging systems are super dusty, lots of gas and dense things, and you want to see into the heart of it. JWST is going to be great for that. Um, it also lets you see emission from the dust. Dust associated with the gas warms up. And then it emits just like a night vision camera. Um, and so JWST lets you sort of see where that is. And we think that the dust goes with the gas and that how hot it is kind of depends on what's lighting it up. So you can learn a lot from that. So JWST has already released images of an ARP galaxy. They, they called it by its boring name, not its ARP name. Um, but on the left is a Hubble image. And then on the right, the middle one, is an image that really highlights that it sees through the dust. And you see that big star pattern? That's because it revealed basically what's called an active galactic nucleus, which is like a lot of matter dumping onto a supermassive black hole in the very heart of this thing, which you really couldn't see here. But then once you see through the dust, you can see it. And then on the far side is a map of the emission from the dusty gas. And so you can see that all of that absorption, that dust absorption that we saw, that was the dust. Now you can actually kind of see it in emission and you don't need a background source to do it. Um, it's also been looking at Stefan's quartet. I've cut off one of them, so it's the triplet. The other guy was sick. Um, and then this is showing the emission from the dusty gas. So you can kind of, so, so there's the stars and then there's all of the dusty gas in there. And so that's it, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Julianne. Yeah. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. And do I have other microphones to someone walking around with microphones or not? Just, okay, so raise your hand and Stephanie will bring you a microphone and um, and I can help guide you, Stephanie, if you need some help finding people, but, but it looks like that's a good place to start. You have I have an almost personal question for you. How confident are you when looking at all of these, essentially a single moment in time in a many, many million year process, that by looking at one of these pictures, you can guess 
you're going to be guessing, but how confident in, are you in your own guesses as to whether you can say at what point in the process a given phenomenon is located? Yeah, so um, there's kind of a stage two for my vision, right? Which is that in the end, to assign time scales, length scales, mass scales to this, you sort of need an additional level of simulation associated with it. And that's something that I think can actually probably be done on computer browsers. And we're just gonna need to modify a little bit of code to let people mess with that. The other thing is that um, I didn't talk about it, but there's um, a group I've been working with in Germany that has been taking what's called integral field spectroscopy of this, which then gets you all of the motions and the spectra. And that combination is very, very constraining. Um, so I think it's, I, I think you have, you're not going to overturn galaxy formation with one system, but we have lots of we have lots of systems. And so I think there's something interesting to learn. I agree that like in any one system, can you say exactly what happened? But people have written entire theses about one of these systems and actually made a fair bit of pro bit of progress about understanding. Like there's a lot of questions like, how far out do dark matter halos go or what shape are they? And once you have tidal tails that go way out there, that's something where it's actually kind of probing interesting things. So I, I, I still think there's interesting stuff we can say, but I agree like uncertainties on any one thing, but in the meanwhile, they look cool. Okay. Uh, Nico has a question online question. Yeah. You, you want to use your mic or do you want to use this? Sorry, I can't get up. I'm holding the webinar laptop. Uh, yeah, that first of all, fantastic talk. I had one question from uh, anonymous attendee, which is just, is it possible to tell what types of gases are present in galaxies? And if yes, what is the most common type of gas? Yeah, so um, most stuff in space is hydrogen and helium. Everything else is a little bit of like salt and seasoning. So in terms of what elements make up the gas, most of it is hydrogen and helium. There's like some oxygen is probably your next biggest thing. Carbon is your next biggest thing. Now the gas can take lots of different phases and lots of different temperatures. Probably most of the gas that's in the universe is actually in that very, very hot phase and has never really bound itself into the kind of core of a galaxy. There's a lot of gas that lives in that diffuse thing. So I would say that the phase of the gas and the majority of it's in this sort of 10, you know, this million degree gas, so. Again, thank you for your talk. Um, question is, once the ARP catalog has been imaged, is there any thought about the Sloan catalog being imaged? Uh, yeah, so there is actually, so this gap filler program that this was part of, there is um, another, there were three approved programs. One of them is called uh, like, Zoo gem. So there's this large citizen science project using the Sloan Digital Sky Survey imaging, which is called Galaxy Zoo, where volunteers look at these images and classify them and measure things. And it's an incredible project. Uh, Lucy Fortson's been very involved in this here. Um, really high citizen engagement. And that entire community collaborated on coming up with a list of things to submit to the same program. So lots of those Sloan ones that people thought were in, interesting from a citizen science per perspective actually also have been having um, imaging taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, my, my therapy such a thing as a black galaxy from which no light can escape. And might we be living in one of those? Uh, well, we're definitely not living in one because we can see the Milky Way above our heads and all of those stars in it. So um, we do think that there are, so this is an interesting question, right? So to make a truly dark galaxy, you would need to have a dark matter halo that didn't have any normal matter associated with it. And it's a little bit hard to have that without that really hot gas component. Now we can't really see that easily with our eyes. So maybe we would miss it. 
Um, we do think that there are lots of what we call subhalos, which are these tiny little knots of dark matter that are probably whirling around the Milky Way halo that we that don't necessarily always have stars. Like if they're very small, sometimes it might not have visible light associated with it. So there are probably dark matter halos that maybe are not currently producing light, but it's probably only very small ones. So, But that's actually an interesting research question because our current best model of dark matter predicts that there should be lots of those, but then what's the signature of that, right? Can we prove that those are there or not there? Hi, so I'm a uh, senior aerospace engineering student, and I think it was mentioned very early on, like in your introduction that you were talking about having ideas about some of these future space telescopes. Yeah. Uh, do you have any suggestions for where I can send my resume to work on some of these yes. projects? Yeah, oh yeah, no, no. These sorts of things are are like they're, um, you know, JWST was in the works starting in, you know, it was first kind of like really mentioned like 1985, I think. So these are long, long projects. Um, NASA centers, JPL, Goddard, like they're always looking for talented engineers, but there's also a lot of the stuff that NASA builds is in close collaboration with a lot of space aeronautics companies um, throughout the US. So, I mean, you should, this guy in the front in the front row, like you guys should talk afterwards. Yeah, just please come see Jeff. After yeah, yeah. That's like, yeah, there's the US has a very active space community, both for um uh you know, public sort of science space, both kind of like the earth observation and then space observation stuff. But there's also like a you know growing space industry where it's satellites that help people monitor crop efficiency and then give people guidance on what to do for irrigation or something. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff. I have a question about the ARP catalog and all the images taken of it. Um, given that it's not a highly observed catalog, how confident are you that the galax two galaxies, especially an elliptical that seem to be interacting, are really at a comparable distance? Oh that yeah, no, that's a that's a that's a total issue with a lot. There are some number of these things that are chance superpositions. Um, now it's hard because like space is very empty, so like the chance that you have two large galaxies sitting one in front of the other across your line of sight isn't very common, but it's not, but it does happen. And so there's definitely some of these where you can see that there is a real, there's, they're close in projection to each other, but there's just absolutely no sign of an interaction. So we think they're probably at very different distances. You can also use spectroscopy that will give you some idea about the relative distances. And so for some of these systems, you know, people have looked at it and verified that like, so like Stefan's quintet, uh, let me see if I can just go back. Uh, that galaxy on the left is not associated with the galaxies on the right. It's just an interloper. So are any of these images in the ARP catalog, are any of those accessible with like a 10 inch telescope from the ground? Yeah, yeah, no, there, there's a large community of amateur, you know, just home astronomers that have guides to how to look at these things and which ones are easy and which ones are hard. Some of them are, um, like the ones that I put in for this Hubble program are matched to the scale of, the Hubble image. There's some that are too big on the sky to really look at easily with Hubble. Some are very, very small and would not be rewarding things to look at. There's um, a hardback book that's kind of like, it's large and it's like an observer's guide and it has finding charts for which ones and gives you guidance on it. So yeah, a lot of these are, you know, are observing targets. I don't have enough experience to say whether like, do you need a 24 inch or what, you know, like, but, but yes, it, the, these are definitely targets of a range of difficulty for an amateur home astronomer. Uh, so I think I heard you say that star clusters do not last very long. Um, Most of it, them. Okay. So what does that mean? <laughs> or okay. What happens to them? So. It's kind of a fundamental rule that, in, at least in space, nature makes 
lots of little things and not very many big things. So if you look at galaxies, there's gazillions of tiny little dwarf galaxies and then not, you know, a tiny fraction of that number in these really big, massive galaxies. Same thing with stars. We make lots of low mass. When gas turns into stars, it makes gazillions of little stars and not that many really, really giant massive stars. Same things with these stellar clusters. It makes lots of ones that are groups of 100 stars and not very many where it's a group of millions of stars. And the ones, so most of them are these low mass clusters and they don't necessarily, most of, when they form, most of the mass is gas. And then as the gas blows out, the stars aren't gravitationally bound and they just trickle away. The very massive ones form globular clusters. So these can be very long lived and can last the age of the universe as a little bound system unless something happens to them. So most of the little ones get destroyed. The very massive ones stand a chance. Pico, did you have another question online? Yeah, there's a very patient person back there. Uh, first of all, a wonderful talk. Thank okay. you very much. Um, you know, I follow what Elon Musk is doing with his new uh, rockets that are very, the, I think they call it a super heavy or something, where it's going to be able to loft uh, some very, very heavy payloads and and be able to, you know, do it very, very inexpensively is, you know, given the importance of space telescopes, is there an effort underway to accelerate the development of new telescopes that could use these new rockets uh, and slash the time it would take to develop and loft them into space? Is that is that something or is, or is all this too new? Uh, no, 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 um, you know, one of the biggest issues with space telescopes is you have to fit them in a rocket and then have it survive going like this for two minutes as it launches. Okay. So like, you know, JWST is this incredibly precise device that has to be aligned to just ridiculous levels. And then they had to fold it up, shove it in a tube and then shake the bejesus out of it and then hope it unfolds, right? So um, so the launch cost is definitely part of it. And if you have a, um, a wider internal fairing in the rocket, you can fit bigger things in it. You maybe don't have to fold it as much. Um, when you're designing it, if it can lift a lot, you don't have to be as careful with the launch margin. So JWST is much larger than Hubble in terms of light collecting area, but it weighs about the same because it was designed, you know, it, but that makes it really fragile and you have to like, so your design tolerances can kind of relax when you have a big, they call it like a big dumb booster, like, you know, something that you can just throw a lot of stuff up. Um, but telescope, the size of telescope that you would want to do in that is still a very complicated endeavor. I think where a lot of the trade space where you're gonna see a lot of innovation is actually in smaller special purpose telescopes, not a general purpose observatory. Something like the Hubble Space Telescope or JWST is like launching the Keck telescope in terms of capability. It's got multiple instruments, it serves multiple purposes, but there are much smaller satellite missions where it's designed to do like one thing, like we're going to do UV spectroscopy of hot stars. And if you make those cheaper, you could probably get a lot more of those special things up. And so anything that does reduce the cost of access to space can make things more frequent, but um, a lot of the, the spend is not so much in the launch. It is in the engineering work and the development work. And that is just time consuming. Oh. Are there any other questions? I just run in here. I'm, I, I got this one. Thank you. What part of the mass do uh, stars and uh, gases and black matter uh, respectively re represent? Um, part of it within a galaxy, part of it depends on where you look. So gas, when it forms, it can release energy through photons and kind of condense down. And so in the very center of an elliptical galaxy, the dark matter doesn't actually contribute that much, but the dark matter is much more extended. So if I measure the fraction of mass in the dark matter as I go out and out and out, you know, it definitely reaches 90% or so. Um, you know, there's, 
And then also a lot of the gas winds up in this very hot phase. And so it's not so easy to detect. So when you, the stars are like nothing, very rarely are the stars actually outside of the very centers of galaxy do the stars matter that much. Um, but these hot halos of gas can contribute a fair bit once you go out. But, but even there, it's not more than five, 10%. Dark matter really rules the game. Not so interesting to look at. Okay, I, we have, let's have these last two questions. If uh, I'll get this one here. Where was the hand? Yeah. So uh, you just said that dark matter rules the game. So my question's regarding dark matter. Um, how, how do we know that dark matter is a substance and not just a mathematical anomaly? In other words, like, sorry, I get nervous. No, no, it's okay. Hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can grab a demo out of my bag. I can't remember if I put it in my purse or not. But here, why don't you, why don't you finish your question while I rummage? In other words, is it possible? Is it possible that it's um, not a substance with mass? that's interacting to make the equations make more sense? Is it possible that it's a potential inconsistency in gravity itself? Yes, so that's, um, so I just wanna kind of quickly just, it's gonna throw this together right now. Okay. Okay, so this is how we know that there is something that has, this is why we think we, okay. So when you look at a galaxy, you see galaxies, spiral galaxies tend to rotate around, okay? Now suppose all the lights are off and you don't see the string. Would you infer the presence of the string? Like what would happen if I cut this string right now? What would happen to that light thing? Right, it would clobber one of you depending on how I was doing this. Okay, so galaxies are rotating at such a speed that if there weren't some additional force of gravity holding it in, things would fly apart. So then the questions are, what is that? Is it a change in what we think the force of gravity is so that we can take the normal matter and say that the force law is different than what we see in the solar system? In the solar system, we know a lot about how things move and everything obeys exactly what you expect for both, you know, for um, sort of Einstein's theory of general relativity, right? Everything behaves exactly like this. So you would have to say that when we get somehow to the scale of galaxies, those laws of physics are somehow different. And there are people who are exploring that, well, when I get in a really low, weak gravitational forces, maybe some different terms become apparent, but galaxies aren't the only place where we see things at that very, what we call like a low gravitational acceleration regime. And uh, fundamentally as astronomers, we have to say that when we look out throughout the universe, the laws of physics here are the laws of physics there. And I would say that the that, that a simple, a model where there's an extra component of mass that is providing the additional gravitational force rather than a change in the law of gravity itself really fits the preponderance of evidence. So all those simulations, they, you know, we put in the dark matter in the very early time and we get all the large scale structure of the galaxies, right? Of how the galaxies are distributed in space. We wouldn't necessarily get that right if we did one of these alternative laws of gravity. So there are people thinking about that and that's good. Um, but I would say the best working, the working model of there is an additional source of gravitational force, which is just mass that isn't lighting up is is a it's the more simple it's the Occam razors solution I think but thanks okay I think we had one yeah. final question on this side is that maybe we didn't uh that was oh, yeah. actually Sorry. my question as well okay. so <laughs> thank you for your talk somebody <laughs> yes. wants that, the, the the actual final question here on the end so. Hi, uh, my question might be a little basic, but how do we know what the shape is of the Milky Way? How did we measure that? Yeah, no, that's a, like that's a big, you know, that was a that was a big question, and you know, parts of the parts of the previous century. 
Um, and it's kind of difficult, right? It's like, you know, what's the shape of this building if all you can do is sit inside the building? And so, you know, you can't go outside of it and look. Um, so it's a combination of things. It's the motions that we see help us infer things. That picture of the night sky with the Milky Way on it, you know, it wouldn't really make sense. You can't have a gravitationally stable like line, right? So disk kind of makes more sense. And when we look at the motions, it looks like a rotating thing. We see other galaxies that look pretty similar where we have an external view of it. And so it kind of makes sense. So there's a lot of, there's this new satellite called the Gaia satellite where they're actually measuring the positions of, you know, millions and millions of stars. Um, and that's helping them infer things about the very detailed structure of the Milky Way. So like exactly what the structure of the Milky Way is, is an ongoing thing. But um, I think we have so many examples. It's the pretty normal galaxy. It's like those pretty but boring normal galaxies from the beginning, I think is our best guess for it. All right, let's thank Julianne again. Thanks.